welcome again to the Free Play Arcade <laughs> podcast. We are live once again, and if you haven't uh, noticed, we're posting on YouTube again. Uh, really, really pumped about it. So I'm going to let everyone do their own introductions this time, except I'll start with me. I am Corey Hyden, president and CEO of Free Play. I am Kelsey Hyden. I'm married to this guy, but I'm also general counsel and corporate liaison. My name is Chris Delp. I'm the community liaison of Free Play. I'm not sure what that means, but you can find me everywhere actually using my own name to compete, Chris Delp. I'm one of the few that does that. I am Arthur Williams, and I'm head of special projects here at Free Play Arcade. All right, so today, guys, we are doing a little bit of catch up on news because we have been away for three years and things have happened since then. <laughs> Nothing's happened. Most of this is relatively recent news, but uh, I thought it would be a good podcast to, to just get caught up maybe on some of the stuff that we talked about previously. Um, years ago, which means this stuff is uh, dragging on if we're talking about it today, probably. Um, okay, so first up, I don't know if y'all are aware, new photo comes out in the Billy Mitchell case. Has anyone heard about this? I've, I've met Billy Mitchell now. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, yeah. wait, hold on. I have something for this. Uh-oh. Oh, yes. What do we got? Oh, there we go. Hey, hey it's so Billy. So when Chris met Billy... He signed this well, gorgeous Well, he came to autograph. the arcade. Yeah. I mean, he did. Yeah, like he, did. he hung out at Free Play for a while. It was a whole thing. In fact, I think we had, that, that should be on our channel, it. isn't it? Yeah, it you should be yeah, able yeah. to see it if you'd like to see it. You could watch um, Billy Mitchell Maybe get a somebody kill will link it right here for you um, Yeah, yeah, later we'll try on. and link it up here. But so he there. signed this lovely photograph, and it went to live in the women's bathroom yeah, at yeah. our corporate office that we used to have. And so I feel like Billy and I have become great friends. And we moved now, and we had to take him down when we moved. And the women's bathroom is currently being remodeled, but I can't wait to put him back up there because so yeah, there's Billy nothing Mitchell, like going to the bathroom and saying, "What up, Billy?" Billy Mitchell is the uh, the ghost, the specter that haunts the uh, the women's restroom at Free Play Corporate, um, which I think you'd be happy about. I don't know. I, yeah, I seem to think that like it would be a good thing. Yeah. So, um, so Billy Mitchell, uh, last time we talked about him, he had sued a bunch of people. He was mad. Um, he'd been kicked out of the record books because he had emulated Donkey Kong. Um, Whoops. and you know, since then he's done, some people have settled with him. I think Guinness said, okay, that's fine. Whatever. We don't care that much. We don't want to be, go through a lawsuit over video games. That's dumb. Um, but Twin Galaxies did not do that. Um, and people on the internet really don't like Billy Mitchell. So like, uh, I guess our background was, we kept saying, you know, it's clear that he used emulation and, and all of that, but also that he's also a, a super talented gamer. Um, and he kind of has a character. He kind of plays the heel. And that's part of like there's there's something kind of interesting and funny and maybe even cool about having an industry where there's like a bad guy. Yeah, he's a talented um, wrestling heel. Yeah, he's really, really good at it. So um, we were kind of I, I think people were a little bit taken aback that we weren't overly negative. Billy Mitchell um, when we and then then, of course, like crazy enough, he came to our arcade. He mm -hmm. he came to the area. He. He said at the time our high score on Donkey Kong. He mm -hmm. still has our high score on Pac-Man, obviously, because he said it was a near perfect Pac-Man right. run. Um, and I think the the real thing that we said is no one can deny that he is capable of doing some really really good things on these old games. Um, and <laughs> so uh, that said, he he is still going through that litigation with Twin Galaxies, and he has these guy people on the internet that are literally like watching his every move. They're tracking all of his appearances. They're researching the history of his life. They're contacting people that might have worked with him to try to get information and dirt on Billy Mitchell. And one of these people, I I, I read somewhere that it's just this, this anonymous poster. I don't remember what name they post under, but they've they keep contacting like anyone who's ever worked for Billy or with Billy or um, any of the conventions that he's gone to. They'll they'll send a message and say, "Do you have any photos from that event?" Stuff like that. They're trying to they're trying to get him on something. Um, and so then these photos just recently surfaced this like uh, a month ago or so. And the photos, uh, the Internet is saying this is a big gotcha moment. And I, I don't know if it's a gotcha moment yet. I want to talk to you all about it. So it's a photo of Billy at the Florida Association of Mortgage um, Brokers convention thing. Um, it kind of looks like he was there at a booth as like a special appearance. I have a black and white printout if, if that helps. I, I've definitely well, seen well, 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 this. Okay, yeah, okay. Seen yeah. I know y'all can see it, but maybe they want to see it. Got it, got you it, know? got it. Like, We're good. We'll okay, it. okay, y'all are good. So, um, Thank you, though. the photo, the main photo that everyone is uh, looking at and that we'll show on this podcast is um, Billy Mitchell shaking hands with um, Todd Rogers, mm -hmm. who is uh, also infamous. But he was Todd Rogers was the referee for the day. Um, and behind them, there's a Donkey Kong machine. And the internet took very quick no to things to notice about the Donkey Kong machine. Mainly, the joystick is not an original Nintendo metal on metal on metal four way joystick. Mm -hmm. um, and, and anyone who's ever owned one of these Nintendo cabs knows that Nintendo used kind of 
like both genius but terrible joysticks on their um, Donkey Kongs versus cabinets, Mario Brothers, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and it has a very distinct feel to right, it when you right. use one of those real joysticks. And and yeah, it, it's it's honestly like I mean, as long as you keep it properly lubricated, they're great joysticks. But the second they're not, especially if they start to get kind of dried out or rusty, they're terrible. They're like the worst four-way joysticks that you've ever touched. <laughs> Um, so in the photo behind him, there's not one of those Nintendo joysticks. There is a red kind of like ball top style, but it's not even a ball top. It's shaft with a built in molded ball, um, joystick, not original. And so a lot of people have gone to the twin galaxies rules at the time and said that, you know, twin galaxies rules. They said it either has to be an original joystick, original hardware, um, or a close replica. Mm -hmm. Um, and the exact closeness of the replica was that's the vague kind of gray area. Um, and so a lot of people have then pointed to that Billy Mitchell, along with a bunch of other witnesses, signed affidavits um, that were allegedly at this mortgage broker's convention saying he played Donkey Kong in front of me. He played on original hardware mm-hmm. and it was all original. And this was signed by both <laughs> Billy Mitchell, um, Todd Rogers, some of their cohorts who have if, if you go on YouTube, you can find plenty of interesting videos just ripping apart everyone of billy's friends who signed these affidavits like guys like they these people hate billy mitchell and anyone who's ever talked to him but to be clear these were signed recently yeah. about this event that happened. yeah yeah so th- this, and this event is more than a decade old now 15 years or something um and so he also had two or three representatives of the mortgage brokers association sign affidavits that said the same thing these are original um everything was original and so different commentators have taken different aspects of this apart, but all of them agree that this means Billy Mitchell is done. His case is dead. He's never going to get to play video games again, like just <laughs> taking it to like full extremes. <laughs> and that like, you know, you know, this is proof. This is proof that he's a, a super, super liar. Um, now, uh, what I'm going to get into and, and what I th- want to talk to both general counsel. Well, first, let's talk to general counsel. OK, so Billy Mitchell who do you think wrote the affidavits that were signed okay, by well, the people let's, let's in the case? Let's start here, just in case you guys don't know what an affidavit fair is, enough, right? Enough. So it's um, it's a statement on paper that's like a sworn statement, and you sign it under, and you have like it's notarized or stamped or whatever, depending um, on your jurisdiction and right. So it'll say, you know, at the top it'll say City of Dallas, County of Dallas. Um, and anyway, um, it's a very official document, and it, it you turn it in in court, and it's basically testimony. Um, under oath. Under oath. It has right. the same effect um, as So, under oath. yeah. So, sorry, I had a whole thought, but I'm not going to go there. Um, so that that's what it is. And the thing about an affidavit is, um, if you're in a court case and you're Billy Mitchell, you don't normally like write your own affidavit. You haven't like gotten in front of your computer and like typed it up, and you know it just gets signed and turned in that way. What normally happens is your lawyer has maybe listened to you say some things, and then they write down what they want to put in your affidavit. And in fact. Um, if you have multiple witnesses, your affidavits may be almost even identical, except for your name changing and things like that. Because the lawyer wants to see in the affidavit the um, the support for the legal arguments the lawyer is going to make. And it's not normally very narrative. And sometimes it, they can even sound like really disjointed because the language is lawyer language more than it is natural language that the um, witness would be using. Yeah. And lawyers generally, right, like they don't want this flowing testimony on, I mean, almost in general, but certainly not in affidavits. It's normally bullet, almost bullet point style. One, two, three, four. This is the point. This is the point. This is the point. Is and right? it, and yeah. if, if they're doing it a good job, like if it should read kind of like it makes sense, but right. it really depends on the quality of authorship <laughs> we're talking about. Um, so what do you think about these affidavits? What do you like? I don't know. I haven't read one. Are you surprised, though, that um, someone from the Mortgage Brokers Association, for example, would sign an affidavit saying that it was all original hardware? So is this like an active Mortgage Brokers Association? Yeah, yeah. So this is the Florida Association of Mortgage Brokers. It's just a trade group for mortgage brokers in, in Florida. And the person signing it is like was involved 10 years ago and is still involved? Yeah, I think or so. The people I mean, they, it's certainly the people who were involved at the time. But I, 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 from what I understand, some of them are still one of the per- people that signed an affidavit is still involved in the Association of Mortgage Brokers. Well, I mean, I guess the real thing is, while an affidavit is a really serious thing to sign as a lawyer, you know, it's a serious thing to sign because it's your sworn testimony. And, you know, you don't want to be lying uh, in sworn testimony for all sorts of reasons. Um, I don't know if laymen, um, non-lawyers really take it all that seriously. Um, so. 
on the one hand, I don't even know if they felt like they were doing something serious by signing that affidavit. For me, the whole thing that I'm thinking about is not a legal question at all. I'm like, who are these people to know whether this was an original machine? Like, does, right. what about being a mortgage broker qualifies you to say yes. those are original parts? So, yeah. And, and I, I mean, I think I, I agree there. And I, But I also could see, you know, if you were just, say, 15 years ago, someone was you were still friendly with them, maybe. And they came to you and they're like, hey, remember when I did this thing? And you in your head, you're like, I do remember. It was a big thing because, like, that's the thing. That he's, was a great day. I tell a, my friends about it sometimes. He sets a Donkey Kong sometimes. world record at yeah. the Mortgage Brokers Association. That doesn't happen every Super Mortgage cool. Brokers Association <laughs> meeting. That's big news um, for mortgage brokers. And so, like, you remember that in your head and you're like – and he's like, do you remember I was – on a Donkey Kong machine and I had a camera pointing to me. We had VCRs. We were taking it very, it was very sure. above board. Do you think you could sign this affidavit? I mean, I guess for me, I could see people, I could see someone just being like, yeah, I'll sign that for you, man. Well, sure. Yeah. I don't think it would be even be a big deal and you probably wouldn't even examine what it said that carefully. All right. So, um, and obviously Todd Rogers will sign any affidavit. <laughs> well, I mean, to, to, I'm, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to way, be, but isn't mean. his word kind of mud? So, so the, if just a quick, really quick background about Todd Rogers. Um, his biggest news story was his dragster record that they finally definitive. Like everyone had always believed it was impossible, and then they definitively proved there is no possible way. Pixel perfect, computer perfect play doesn't get his record. Um, it was kind of like uh, the person from King of Kong who submitted like whatever that was, like a three million point score on Donkey Kong. Um, it just can't happen. Um, so Todd Rogers though hadn't had a lot of records at the time. I don't even remember hundreds and hundreds of records. And Twin Galaxy kicked him out, banned him forever, and um, r- deleted all of his records. There were other records that were proved the same way. Like you know, there were, he was submitting scores that were simply impossible. And uh, like there was some nuance to it. So I don't want to be unfair to Todd Rogers. Um, that like, because I think clearly he was another person who was really, really good at these games, but he wanted the best and he wanted it to be unimpeachable. Like no one could ever touch his record. And he's, since he's the referee for Twin Galaxies, he, his word will be gold. Um, and then it turned out not to be. Um, so Todd Rogers signed the affidavit. And generally anyone, I watched a really funny video of someone talking about some of the other people that signed the affidavit. And they were like, this is how many times they've been committed a fraud. Like it was multiple times. <laughs> so, Ooh, um, yeah, that's a rough which, one. Which I assume. Wait, it, the affidavits, a lot of them are signed by people. Well, at least one of them is signed on behalf uh, from Billy Mitchell's friend who swears it's an authentic cabinet. And then apparently they're like banned from trading securities in some states. There's fraud. Ever. Like, I don't know all the details, so I don't want to get sued or anything. But like uh, when you start going down the list of the affidavit support signed, mm-hmm. you're just kind of like, mm-hmm. it's either these mortgage brokers probably don't really wouldn't know if it was right, real. Right. I don't think the mortgage brokers have to be like dishonest to have signed this affidavit and to believe that it means what it says. Now, here's here's an interesting question, though. And this is what I've been thinking about. Do you think Billy Mitchell thought it was real? Like th- thought the joy thought it was an or thought that the joystick thought that nothing would like if a photo did come out that it would show that there was a joystick that wasn't original because like I've played on a lot of arcade cabinets right and though I know at free play which ones have the exact perfect joystick which ones have a, a later repro which is, would be allowed under Twin Galaxies rules and stuff and you know like for example there's those Monroe joysticks sometimes are we have to pull out for a time to service them because they're a lot more complicated and we'll put in a temporary just kind of backup joystick that's kind of like a Monroe but it's not identical um, do you think that, and and of course if there was a world record run we would always make sure that was 100% authentic, the original stuff. But, like, do you think there's a chance that he played this Donkey Kong and didn't think about whether or not the joystick was real, or do you think he he was aware? Billy it's, Mitchell is an incredibly skilled video game player. Like, like I don't think that – I think that he was cheating, right? But I think that he was, like, one of the best video game players I've ever seen. Well, yeah, I guess that's the, the in the background here. If – you're that skilled at something. I am 100% sure that you'd be aware that the those joysticks were not the typical joysticks. And I'm I'm with Arthur Arthur here and that as a as a skilled gamer who has been playing Donkey Kong since it's since the very beginning. Yeah, you instantly know that that's not the the joystick that I grew up with. Now, did he think that that was a problem or an advantage even? I I I couldn't say that for sure. In fact, I feel like I'm not, I'm not as hyper vigilant about this as uh, clearly the internet is. Um, but did, did the to the simple question of did he know that it wasn't the original type of Donkey Kong joystick? Absolutely, he knew. Yeah, but was that really on people's radar at the time? At, at like, like you said, as being a problem, or did well, yeah, he just play games is, well, as he found them? And and to to that question, I doubt it. 
Um, before free play opened, um, I had assumed that a arcade was opening near my house. That's cool. I assume everything's going to be emulated and half of it's going to be broken and I'm just going to support my local arcade because no arcades exist. Well, now, lo and behold, I show it up and it was awesome and it was all authentic and it turned me into an arcade snob. But at the moment, <laughs> I was expecting what I had encountered in the 90s, which was um, secondary market joysticks thrown on things, um, maybe uh, different monitors tossed in things. I, my 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 thoughts on doing that was just like, was it a joystick, right? If it was a joystick, I'd find a way. And honestly, I've been in some competitions where it was aggressively not a joystick and it was like, figure out how to do it anyway. So I've done those too. Um, so yes, the thought process at the time was quite a bit different than now. Well, in this particular case though, so the, the crux of the matter, I think, is the four-way versus eight-way well, thing. Well, one of the things I, I want to point out here is simply it being a joystick that traditionally is an eight-way joystick doesn't mean it's an eight-way joystick. So I do think that that's one of the things that's been really missed on the internet um, is like uh, – because I, I think you're about to get into whether or not that is an advantage and stuff like that. I was about to say that before then, but uh, keep okay. going. Well, I, what, I, what I think is really interesting is – um, and, and we should talk about it in a second after Arthur finishes his point, whether or not if it's a four-way joystick, if we even care that there was a four-way replacement joystick. But Arthur, go ahead. Okay, so a joystick will have a thing called a gate at, underneath the uh, underneath the table, and it usually is either an octagonal shape, which is kind of rare, or a square shape. If the square shape is perpendicular to everything, then you can go to a corner and it'll hit both like up and left at the same time. But if you rotate it 45 degrees, then if you try to, then the corners are at straight up and straight left, and halfway in between, you'll not be going far enough to trigger either left or up. Uh, a lot of joysticks, you can actually uh, rotate the gate really easily. So the same joystick can be an eight-way joystick or a four-way joystick, depending on which direction the gate is rotated. Yeah, and, and what and this image doesn't show is, you know, what the joystick actually is. So I or what it was set to at the time. Well, yeah, and to that point, I mean, there's there's some joysticks you can buy from the factory that have two-way, four-way, eight-way, oh, yeah. like two. just tons of different gate options, and that's just like, it could be any of them. Um, I mean, and some of the modern arcades we, we build or we buy will have a modern joystick that's a two-way joystick, and it's only a two-way joystick because of the gate, mm -hmm. um, because that's all it can go to. It's just locked into that that kind of range, so... Yeah. yeah, Killer so, Queen uses the same joysticks for the uh, the the bears as well as for the queen, but the queen is unlocked to being able to hit multiple directions, but the bears can only go left or right, I think. All right, Correct. so so ignoring yeah. the emulation issue, um, the emulation issue aside, you from this image you can't actually see if he's playing on a four and eight way stick. So if it's a four way, um, if it's do a four you way, care? Does anyone care here? I would like, say it's close enough. Is it? Right. It's a technical violation, right? Well, so it, it depends it? on how. So it says it has to be as close as possible to the. And I'll, well, I can, as close I'll, as possible. I'll, I'll That's pull. Up, let me pull up the actual Twin Galaxies language, so I don't say anything wrong. But well, while you do that, um, regardless of the Twin Galaxies language, I do not care. Right. Yeah, I, I do not care. I'm it's, not it's as four, serious it's of a gamer. Joystick. I don't care either. Like, like in some cases, these replacement I replacements that I did play on, and I played Ms. Pac Man in a laundromat with the ball top removed and it couldn't display the color red. And the third stage has red dots. It actually made it interesting in a way, but like, okay. <laughs> yes, if well, you can joy do four ways, then yeah, I'm good. Let me, I guess, I don't know exactly what the rules were when this was submitted. Cause, mm -hmm. cause let me be clear, Billy Mitchell followed very few of the rules that exist right now for submitting a Donkey Kong. Like it required full video of the inside of the game. It required full video of the control panel or photo, like concurrent photos. He didn't do any of that. Wow, There's, it would have really helped if but, he had done so, those things. So right now how it reads, I, I guess it wouldn't um, fit, but I, I, I think I'm going to get very upset at these rules very soon. So give me a second here. But this is the rule as it is written today. The joystick itself must be an original stock four-way joystick, four-way Donkey Kong arcade joystick, or a replacement four-way joystick of exact size and shape as the original Donkey Kong arcade joystick. Well, it's um, not the size or shape. That's true. That's true. Um, and what I would say is like, if those are the rules the Twin Galaxies wants to run, they need to start all the records over yeah right? yeah mm -hmm. like because there is no way any of the rules from the nine any any of these games from the 90s were still running those joysticks mm -hmm. not a single one mm -hmm. 
Like, I mean, okay, that's that's an overstatement, but in, it's, in collections, it's maybe. so it's like, yeah, if you, if it was at a public arcade, because these joysticks disappeared, right? Um, and and operators were using whatever the heck they could find, and modern replicas are not the exact size and shape. Mm-hmm. Modern replicas are not. So, the only joystick here would be an original Nintendo joystick, um, because the, some of the Nintendo joystick. Now that said, and I don't want to, Donkey Kong shipped with multiple different joysticks. <laughs> Mm. Um, they're not all identical. Well, I I have played on a Donkey Kong cabinet more than once that would have the same as the Play Choice, right? Like which octagonal is, gate yeah. joysticks, which always felt kind of weird to me. Well, and yeah, and and so obviously but those are Nintendo joysticks, and obviously they're Donkey Kong cocktails that I think slightly different joysticks. I mean, there's definitely variations of the original joystick because there's different post size or different because you can. I just I kind of want to see the uh, the Donkey Kong Junior world record as is on the cocktail with the with right. the joystick that's on the side like this because right. that's uh, quite the adventure. <laughs> well, and and but authentic. So, I mean, those are the rules right now and they have very I mean, like nowadays obviously given the the attention, they have some serious requirements that Billy Mitchell didn't meet any of these, but at the same time, I don't know if these were the, even close to the rules back then. Mm-hmm. Um because they I don't think that Twin Galaxies was that and this is not trying to be mean again and not trying to start any internet technology drama. Technology has progressed. Well, Twin yeah. Galaxies didn't care back then either. Right. Like they didn't they wanted new records. They didn't want they didn't they weren't spending a lot of time verifying clearly. Mm-hmm. Um so like they just wanted record record because that's news. That's published. That's mm-hmm. stuff that you can go out and tell people about to keep interested in Twin Galaxies, to keep interested in playing video games, arcade games, stuff like that. Um, so, uh, that's, that's one of the things. The other thing is, so the joystick, if it is four way, it's also taller, which I think every Donkey Kong player in the country would say that's a disadvantage, not an advantage. Mm. Um, that said, we could talk really quick. I don't know how many of y'all have tried an eight way joystick on Donkey Kong and whether or not that's an advantage or a disadvantage. Now, yes, it's a technical violation of the rules, but I don't, you know, like these, I don't think these rules were, were in existence. And if they were, they weren't being enforced. So I don't, well, maybe we shouldn't care about a technical violation right. like that. Well, the, the A-Way actually makes a pretty big difference in, in actual gameplay, though. If you're holding a diagonal and you're walking forwards, then on the first frame possible, you can go up the ladder, it'll start climbing up the ladder. So there's no room for error on, yeah, I, I hit know, up a frame too late or I hit up a frame too early, so I just stop and stand still because I'm not quite to the ladder yet. I've read that, and when I tried it, I could not, like, I actually had the game more often me getting stuck at the top of the ladder um, and not getting to the post before. Like, so, I mean, I, I've read that there's a technical possible advantage, but when I tried it, I could not recreate it at all. Uh, um, for me, uh, I, I've tried Pac-Man on an eight-way joystick, <laughs> and it's it's an adventure. I don't right. like it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Could you possibly make a technical exploit for it? I guess. But, like, it's... Boy, you'd have to retrain yourself entirely on how to play the game. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't. <laughs> if you give me the option of, uh, hey, Chris, your life depends on setting a record on Donkey Kong. You can have an eight-way joystick or a four-way joystick. I say, give me the four-way joystick. And I guess so. Like now, let's do in terms of like bad. Like because again, we can't tell if this is a four-way or eight-way joystick. We just know that it's traditionally sold as an eight-way joystick. But you know, we've. That's that's not a big deal, and that's obviously going to be his response, right? He's immediately going to thing and file a response that says uh, it was a four-way joystick, and like you can't prove it's not a four-way right. joystick, and, right? And yeah, and getting into the technical Twin Galaxies rules is not going to go well for Twin Galaxies because they accepted this score. So like, yeah. if Twin Galaxies starts saying like, you know, oh, he did, there's there's other technicalities you didn't follow, that's a Twin Galaxies problem, right? Yeah. Not not Billy Mitchell's. He submitted it and right. they accepted it. Yeah. If they had a problem with it, they should have brought it up at the time. Um, so, like, people have that's that's like really one of the reasons I want to talk about it. People, the internet's been like, this is a big gotcha. No, like, I don't think so at all. Yeah. Um, I think I think Billy Mitchell and his attorneys are gonna gonna feast on this. Now, that said, this is these are the first times we've ever seen photos of the cabinets Billy Mitchell played on. And so, like, I've long talked about how, you know, like it has the emulation glitch, right? Um, it's in the baked in the video. Um, so like that's pretty much definitive proof that it was emulated. Like I, I we've we've said it definitively pl- plenty of times. But yeah. That was that was clearly emulation. Um, like we weren't there, but th- th- no the real video, the, the, video. Yeah, you know, the video the, the video yeah. there. <laughs> so that said, do you think like so? I've been trying to think about like getting into Billy Mitchell's mindset mm-hmm. here. Do you think he really knew 
like 100% that this was an emulated game. So we know where the game came from. It came from a, a game. Well, we're talk- st- are we talking about two different submissions, right? One's the video, and then another one is this, but, this but, one, right? But this one was just video two. Okay. okay. Um, the only, because we never, had, this is the big news here is that we saw photos of the actual cabinet. Mm-hmm. Now, according to Billy Mitchell, it was the same cabinet both times from a company in Florida that rents and sells arcade games. I see. Um, that provided this cabinet and he so like and, and the person who rents and sells arcade game said it's all original so um and they said that it's sworn testimony in court now now i the, the again the, the joystick gotcha i don't think that's gonna like i know people hate billy mitchell and really want to get them but i don't mm-hmm. think that that's that's gonna get them so much but what i do wonder is like i'm starting to think i wonder if billy like billy mitchell knew like i, I i'm not trying to defend billy mitchell but I wonder if he didn't just call them and say, hey, I want a Donkey Kong cabinet. And he's because we've seen him live. He's a really good Donkey Kong player. Yes. On, certainly. And, and he at free play, he was playing an authentic Donkey Kong with an original Nintendo joystick. Yep. And he was putting in t- together some good runs. And you could tell. And he'd already been playing video games like 15 hours, 16 hours mm-hmm. that day. And you could tell he was so frustrated he wasn't doing even better. Right. Right. And you could tell that he had the capability to do better. And he, he was, wanted to kill screen it at right, the arcade. Right. Right. Which, by the way, we still want him to kill screen it at the right, arcade. Right. 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 And, and Billy Certainly. Mitchell, you're always welcome back to play our hardware and mm-hmm. to, to show us how good you are at these we games. We have a new score for you to beat. Yeah. And you're no longer the Donkey Kong high score holder. And and that's that's the real thing. We gave him a real Pac-Man. He kill screen the real Pac-Man. Yes. Who's our current high score holder? Is it Ed? Ed. Yeah. All right. Congratulations, Ed. Sh- shout outs to Ed Pan. Yeah, I mean, well, and it's it's been my dream to like have Billy Mitchell scores beat because like I really like I hated all the people that were talking trash about Billy Mitchell, but he he put up at my arcade, right? I said I want to see him do it on a real cabinet. We gave him a real cabinet, and he, he did some good solid. I mean, solid. Right. There's Don no scores. question that and, he's very talented. And, and oh, absolutely. So like, I like I I hate emulation. Like everyone knows <laughs> this about me, down to my core, but. There is certainly a chance, even some of the games that I know really, really well, that if I was in a not my home arcade, if I was in a new location and it was really well done, I might not know. Yeah, but you're not kill screening these games. You well, have not played any single game enough to do that, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason that people were able to discern that the video was done via emulation was because of vertical tearing, right? Right. Yeah, like Billy Mitchell... You know, a, a titan of the game, one of the best players that ever existed for it. He would notice something weird like that, I'm sure. Yeah, but what if the what if the person who provided the game just said um, that you know we're having issues with the monitor? I mean, he would know something's up at the very it's least. A, it's a, right. it's a, it's a I, sink I think issue. That's, so even me, my I'm I'm definitely the lowly video game player here at this table. Like when a game is playing weird, I notice that it's weird. And I don't immediately think, oh, it's emulation or there's something wrong with it. But what I do is I go to Corey and I'm like, I was playing this game and it was really weird. The timing was different or or whatever. And like, it just seemed really slow or really fat or whatever. And he's like, oh, I can tell you what the deal is there. Yeah, it's true. Billy Mitchell played so many video games and not just video games generally, but this game, he had to have known it. So I guess what I go back to, so like I actually, based on the testimony so far and based... I think Billy Mitchell went to this mortgage broker's convention, played on this cabinet, actually authentically got whatever the million point score was mm. on an emulated Donkey Kong. Why why would he do that? Well, like I don't think that he knew. Like in all honesty. Oh yeah, see that's that's what I was wondering. Like I I'm sure that he would have noticed the joystick no matter what. Right, right. And he probably noticed that, you know, the 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 vertical tearing and, at and, some point. And what I will say, and this is in defense of Billy Mitchell, at this point, Billy Mitchell was probably used to playing whatever crap they gave him. That's what I'm saying. I yes. agree with that. In the 90s, we had to just do what we had it, to this, do. It, like, I competed in tournaments where I couldn't press down into the left I mean, at the yeah, same I mean, time. And you know what I had to do? Learn how to play on the fly on a joystick that did not go down well, and the left at the same and, time. And what I will say is from, like, 1995, well, and especially from, like, 2000 to, when, to 2012 or whenever this was whenever it submitted, there were very few arcades that would have a Donkey Kong. You were always getting what whoever would bring their Donkey Kong, and you were probably playing it as you found it because that's it. That's what you get. Mm-hmm. So, like, all right, so Arthur, your team, you don't think he knew it was emulation? I, I don't think that he did. Because, like, what would he gain? I'm just team, like, I don't think he thought it mattered. 
That's what I think. But yeah. What year was this also? 2007? Uh, I can pull it up exactly. Because I think uh, – let me just pull up the date so I don't say the wrong Sure. Put, put me on team – like I can imagine myself trying to set a world record on a machine that was provided to me and not know. Like I, I bet I could break a world record score on a machine and not know it's emulated because – It was I 2007. Know the game yeah. that well, right? Uh, he knows Donkey Kong super well. But still, emulation – if I'm not actively looking for it, if I'm focused on laser sharp uh, frame perfect jumps and moving up the ladder at the exact right frame, I'm not looking at the in between the stage rastering of the 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 images. I'm I'm in fact I'm blinking at that point because I can't blink during the stage. Well, and of course, um, Donkey Kong is like of the meme terrible games that like, that you find on like the sixteen ones or the nine yeah. ones or the three ones. Donkey Kong and Miss Pac-Man are probably the two best emulated. Okay, so I guess maybe for me that it lies in what's the difference aside from the vertical tearing? What's like, is there a difference? Is it an advantage to play an emulated one? So so here's, I mean, here's why you would ban it, right? Because you could, you could, emulation gives you all sorts of fun options like save states. You can pause, right. you could edit the video. You could, you could actually tech. Right, and that was my understanding about the issue with his video. Is which that... which which I think is what everyone said in response to that first one. Mm-hmm. Now this mortgage broker's one, like again, there's people are having to make assumptions one way or another because we don't have a hundred percent of the details. What we do know is there are lots of people who have testified truthfully they saw Billy Mitchell playing this Donkey Kong cabinet and getting a million points or whatever the score he submitted was. Well, I I don't dispute that. So so with that information and we have we have normal people, we have Billy Mitchell supporters, we have just random attendees, we have a decent amount of information about this. What we don't know is exactly like, is that for sure the one he submitted to Twin Galaxy? We don't know. Like, we don't know if he, you know, even recorded this run. But we do know that at this event, he seems to have scored the score that he says he did on an emulated Donkey Kong, which technically, like, there could be all sorts of issues. And but it's mainly, you know, very minor gameplay issues. Um, I know that, like, tool you can use tool assisted stuff. Um, wait, wait, back sorry, then, what's that? Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. You can have a perfect recording of yourself playing. And it, in around 2002, there was a video that became kind of famous that you may have seen where some guy plays Mario 3 and he goes through and maybe you saw it and he gets like 99 lives jumping on everything and beats the game pretty quick. It does sound familiar. All right. Well, like that was made via a guy using save states and reloading like a million times in a row and using the emulator's uh, recording function to have a perfect play and you can do things like that in, in just about any game and that was kind of the first time it showed up on, on my radar that people would do things like that yeah you can make and, fake videos so like there's there's certainly an, a possibility that billy mitchell showed up at this mortgage brokers thing scored like six hundred thousand, which is way more than anyone else was going to score anywhere near and no one really really remembers the exact score to be fair and then he submitted a, video a different video um because, you know, one of his big proofs here is, like, I did it in public and stuff like that. But yeah. there's very little exact evidence. There's not, like, a photo of the score. There's but, like, a- yeah, if, and if you're a mortgage broker and you go to this thing, are right. you really going to – you might walk away and be, like, he scored, like, a million points. Well, that, but you're, are you're you probably, really like, he scored, like, a billion points. Yeah, <laughs> or whatever. It, I mean, whatever it is sounds like the right number to you. But, so, like, who's really remembering? So, yeah. So, anyway, I mean, that, we don't really have anything to add. But I but, did think it was interesting, Billy Mitchell News. And to me, I'm starting to think that there's a chance – that Billy Mitchell truly believes he's innocent. Like, and that was the, the weirder thing. Because when I first got news of this, I was like, he knew. He was, he, this is tool assisted. He just wanted to, be, like, own the record and stuff. But now I think there's this sliver of chance. He might just, you know, he was playing on emulation. He was using the wrong joystick. But he might not have really known but that he was doing something bad. Th- that's the thing, though. Like, uh, if in 2007, before any of this controversy had happened, a decade before any of this controversy had happened, like, uh, who would have cared, you know? Right. And and he's like, well, I'm going to play in this Donkey Kong game, and I'm going to do my best high score, and it's not exactly what I'm expecting, but whatever. Oh, hey, 1 million, whatever, 30,000 points. Well, and we know that Billy Mitchell, he showed up, he showed up to all, like, the Kong offs, right, where they had mm-hmm. very strict hardware rules and stuff like that. Um, and he put up good scores. He never, I don't think he won any or anything, but he was, you know, he's a competitive. He, belong, he belonged yeah, in the room. he's a competitive Donkey Kong player, so. Apparently. So I yeah um, I what I what I would say is I really wish I could depose the um, the arcade game provider, like 
Because, you know, he's been lying. Me too. I would love to hear you grill some arcade providers. He's been telling. You're like, they should call (laughs) you in. You're the perfect person for that job. There's no one on the face of the planet that is better suited to do that. Because I think if I could get that guy to crack, we would know if Billy's innocent or not. Oh, my goodness. Like, very quickly. Is that the new podcast? We're going to have you litigate some of this stuff? Because, honestly, because in Texas, I don't know what you get in Florida. In Texas, I would get him. Un, uninterfer- un, un, uninterrupted for six straight hours um <laughs> and you give me that guy for uninterrupted for six straight hours i i think we would get a lot of good information um so anyways um that's the billy mitchell news we don't have we have nothing to add i just thought it was interesting um and, and everything all right so uh we're going to talk not next about new games that have come out for the arcade since the pandemic uh. um because you know going into the pandemic there was all this really good hype about new arcade games, indie manufacturers, indie game developers putting new stuff out at the arcade because just before the pandemic, arcades were, you know, way sky high, going up, going up, going up. And now and and now I think they're we're seeing a good rebound and everything. But um, now that we're three years ish away from the pandemic, we have some of these games that we were expecting. Mm -hmm. So the first game I want to talk about, um, we just released it over at Free Play Denton. It's called Retro Raccoons. Um, and I want to give a little bit of background because I think we need some general counsel discussion oh, okay. here. Yeah, right. I don't think you knew I this I don't know anything coming. about this game either, and I haven't okay. played it. So. so this was originally called, back in 2019, was when I first encountered this game. It was called Tipsy Raccoons. Um, and it was the world's first drink cade. You didn't buy into it with a quarter. You bought into it with a drink. And you set your drink in a cup holder, and that's how you got a credit for the game. <laughs> Now, now, let me be clear. That functionality is still in there. So we'll get to the changes they got made. It. So, yeah. So the, they were trying to target, like, your brewers, your breweries um, or your bars or anything like that. Someone who doesn't really want to get a quarter necessarily or even, you know, more from – they want to encourage people to enjoy the libations available, have a good time. But, um, like, I could literally bring my own cup, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like... You could use a bottle of water. It didn't really matter. Okay. Um, it's just a little sensor. So it's just a switch. So you put it on there and it triggers the switch and you get a credit to play the game. Okay. Um, but you know, kind of a fun model. And, I like it. And so originally, the game had um, the loser's drink between levels. So you would lose the level, and it's a party game. You've got four up to four players, um, and you just do these little mini games, mm-hmm. fast mini games. And at the end, it would say, loser's drink, and you would drink, and then you put your drink back. Um, that was back when it was called Tipsy Raccoons. <laughs> um, and, you know, really well-polished game back in 2019. And if you go look at the version that was out in 2019, it was really, really impressive. And then, you know, 2020 happened. And now, though, it's been picked up by um, a couple major uh, publishers of arcade games. It's getting built in real factories and stuff like that. And it's called Retro Raccoons. And Retro Raccoons is no longer Tipsy Raccoons. And between the... Well, first, do you think there's any potential issue or liability or anything having between levels the losers... It says, losers drink. Well, and, and so what it, it actually does sense when you pick up the drink and you would have to pick up the drink and you have to put it back down at least. So what are your thoughts? Um, what well, are your thoughts? I don't know. I, I, I have not done legal research on this issue. <laughs> I could imagine that there could be a court case out there involving like beer pong um, that might be informative. Well, I do remember this. the first time I went to a bar and saw beer pong. I was like my head. Ex- and I, was, right. I think I was in law school. So I was like, what? Right. No way. This is not good. I mean, I would say generally... In Texas, at least, we don't love things that overly encourage people to drink. Um, I know that it's something we've thought of. we we like our own beer pong here at Free Play, um, and when we consider doing it for staff parties, we've had to think about how exactly that needs to work so that nobody feels pressured to do anything that they don't want to do and everyone drinks responsibly. So I would say, as a commercial business, you know, I I don't know. Um, I, I think there's arguments either way. I would just be really interested to see what you know, what the case law had kind of come up with on anything similar um, before I could really tell you. Um, I would not want us doing that at free play just for um, safety's sake. Um, but at the same time, like maybe if you put like a little so, note that said, you know, so you could just I, pick up and put your, pick, you it, know, like and just told people they didn't really need to drink their drink if they, I mean, I don't know. I think there's ways to do it. That and you I will say it got picked trouble. up by Incredible Technologies. Their main game is Golden Tea. And in fact, mm-hmm. right now they have primarily like Two games, Golden Tea and Retro Raccoons. Hmm. Um, what though? Bring what back do you, Time Killers. 
<laughs> well, I, it, they have something called the Arcade Collection, where I think they have some <laughs> legacy titles. I was kidding. Do not bring back Time Killers. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, be careful what you wish for. Um, but how do you think they changed it to fix the drink loser's drink? Well, what, do you, what do you think they did? Oh, I mean, I... I'll tell you, they okay. still... Everybody drink. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, so now it says... It's very specific and explicit in what you want. What it oh, wants. it says drink some water? It says, no, it says everybody cheers. And then it's like, you do not have to drink at the bottom. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's kind of what so, I was so saying. So now you cheers and you put your drink back and you don't have to drink. There's no, no one's forcing. And, okay. and throughout the game, there's constant like responsible messages and like drink responsibly. <laughs> and um, cheers does not mean drink and stuff like that, which I have to say, I thought they went a little too far on it. I feel it was, like, yeah, I like, feel it's, hassled by that a little bit. It was, you know, it was a fun game. And like, I, I think a single message of drink responsibly, this is not, you know, you can, you don't have to use an alcoholic beverage. Like, right. Which is how you make beer pong really accessible. Right. <laughs> That's how you get the kids to play the beer pong. <laughs> well, I like beer pong. Um, I don't always. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, that's now at Free Play Denton. Uh, I think if it goes well, well, we'll look at putting it at the other locations. I'm, I'm really interested to see the feedback. Arthur, what did you think of the game? I know you played it. I thought it was a lot of fun. It, I didn't play all the mini games that it had, but they were enjoyable. They controlled well enough and, uh, you know, lift your glass, whatever. We played with... Um, <laughs> The sparkling waters. The sparkling waters. <laughs> I was about to say seltzers, but then I'm like, but non-alcoholic, so whatever. <laughs> anyway, the... the uh, the cup holder mechanism worked really well, and I was, I hope that it continues to work really well as people spill into it, but right. only time will tell. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and the cool thing is, you know, like Free Play is going to make our own version, right? And it's called Drunk Raccoons, and it just has shot glass sized cup holder switches instead. <laughs> <laughs> and then it'll say, you don't, please drink response. No, I'm just kidding. We're not, we're not going to make that. Don't sue us, incredible. So, and I'm sorry, which arcade? Denton has this? Denton, Denton. Yeah, okay. it's, it's, on, it's in the upstairs in Denton now. Um, because and it's it's I, I do actually think though conceptually it's really really cool when it says four dr instead of four coins needed four drinks needed or whatever and you mm -hmm. put your drink in the cup holder and it credits your little and you become active and everything I think that's really cool um, I think that that's uh, a really really neat I like it too it's fun it's physical which is which is fun what I do think and I, I they probably are going to be mad at me because I use it in some of the marketing but their original tagline was like the world's first drink cade I mm -hmm. think they've dropped that or. Something like that. I can't remember what they said. They have a patent for. I mean, for there's nothing about drink that suggests it's alcoholic. They have a patent though for literally having a button underneath the cup holder, so no one else can do that. So, I don't know. Good luck, mm. Arthur. We can't we can't incorporate that into any. Of I our mean, games. I guess the real thing is Understood. the changes they have made. Clearly, they feel. Well, I'm on the right side. All so. I can think is like Incredible Technology is picking that up, and you know, they Golden Sea is is largely a bar game, and so they probably. What What's really interesting though is I haven't seen this game out that in that many places. Um, it has to be out in more because since it is a major um, publisher, and it is, it, I assume most of your major distributors have it in stock. Um, I assume it's out there at like some regular arcades. I haven't seen it. Um, I know quasars and corpus christi might be the only other place in texas to play it but it could be literally everywhere because like that's the that's the thing about these modern games like sometimes they're they are everywhere but here's one that's not everywhere um nidhogg 2 now out on the arcade what what um so this was really interesting because um if you've ever come to free play richardson where we have our walk aids um and actually at free play arlington where we had the uh the red bull cap basically anything that has one of like the ps4s inside of it or anything that we try to um arcadify We've used Nidhogg before, Nidhogg 1 normally. And it's this dueling game where you both fight each other and you run. It's really, really it's fun. It's crazy fun, y'all. I love it. Like, it is so fun to just walk up and play with whoever. But, so, Nidhogg 2 came out. And I actually feel really bad for the, the developers. Um, because Nidhogg 2 came out. Nidhogg 1 was kind of, like, very low, like, low graphical. Like, it, it's just pixel art, basically. Um, two colors, I think, even. Um, and like, it's a re and a very balanced game because you just each have like long Simplistic swords. Or, even, or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for Nidhogg Two, obviously they got to do some new stuff. They incorporated like a really, really, really insane art style. Mm -hmm. Like it's absurd. Um, and Looks great too. Yeah, I. So that's the real thing. Like, I wonder if anyone else pictured it on arcade when they made this because I think people were playing on their computer screens, and there's a lot of people who were like, "The old one was so beautiful and elegant, and this one is just like assaulting my eyes." And I'm like, "Yeah, it, yeah, it's assaulting your eyes, and it's great." 
It's gonna eat you in the end. You should love. And so then they made this. <laughs> they made this arcade cabinet, and it's gloriously. And so, um, it's gloriously colorful and, mm-hmm. and insane. And and of course, the gameplay is is absurd and insane. And a lot of people criticize the second one because you get random weapons instead of all everyone having the same. And they were like. That makes that takes it out of the fighting game sphere because it's not even. And I'm like, fighting games have never been fair. Like, there's always characters that are stronger and stuff like that. Um, and since the game goes over multiple levels and everything, it to me it's fair. But I don't know. There's there's some there's some criticism there. No one likes the there's a bow and arrow aspect to it. Although when we were playing it, I didn't feel like the bow and arrow was like overpowered. Um, I liked having the dagger vest the few times that I played it. Well, and everyone would say that's the worst weapon to have. Well, I don't know what to tell you then. <laughs> well, and and then truthfully, like, I guess that's the thing. I don't want Nidhogg 2 to get, like, overly, like, I don't want, like, pro Nidhogg 2 players. I want I want people I having. I think the best thing about the game, like, both, I haven't played the second one, but it's just, like, not getting super good and just, like, kind of duking it out with somebody, which is why I don't play Arthur. because sure <laughs> He's really going to dagger you in the right? face. <laughs> and that, that's the thing the dagger works for him because like he's so good you can have the bow and arrow but but i mean it's a it's a really really fun game and it belongs in the arcade like that's the that's the best Mm -hmm. thing about nidhogg like both one and two i think should be in the arcade i think they're very clear like choices and nidhogg 2 has all of this and what i really want to say is i appreciate to the developer they made a version of nidhogg 2 that's just an arcade version i mean it's basically nidhogg 2 but it eliminates all these menus and stuff like that the settings all that stuff that you don't want to have access to so like every time we've put nidhog on one of those um wallcades or anything else eh, people could mess with them if they really wanted to um but not nidhog too it's a dedicated arcade that got a beautiful cabinet we're the only place in texas that has it um right now and i pretty much the only place in the south um i think there's a couple in california and a couple in the northeast maybe one in florida there's one in florida at like a tattoo studio that i found huh um because they have like a game listing but um, I mean, ours were like the 10th and 11th or 12th and 13th or something that came off the, the line. Um, and we've got it at, out at Freeplay Richardson and Freeplay Fort Worth. So um, that was one of the things we've been talking about is making sure that all of our locations get these new kind of fun things. I don't um, know if uh, I don't know what it's like at the Fort Worth location, but Richardson's on the end of a line. And it has this side art that's just beautiful. So next time you're Preplay Richardson, take a look. It's really cool looking. So at Fort Worth, I put it in one of the four main games in the lobby. So it's on the very end. And so like the beautiful worm gross thing is just like right in your face. And it's so colorful (laughs) and awesome. Awesome. Um, So, yeah, so that's that's come out. Um, I thought that was really, really awesome. Um, And what I really think is the, the most awesome about everything is we have new indie and interesting arcade games that are being made kind of targeting for our audiences or you know because we're not really like a you know we're not necessarily an arcade bar we're really an arcade that then has really great bar really great food all of that um so but seeing these types of games kind of targeting it targeted towards our style so cool so Mm -hmm. awesome all right and then we're going to talk about the one that we have that no one else has um that is probably the most anticipated most sought after and uh, probably the most like audacious um, possible arcade game that I could conceive. So it's um, Enter the Gungeon House of the Gun Dead, um, made by our friends over at Griffin Aerospace. It's is it Aerospace Aerotech, or Aerotech? Aerotech. Sorry, Griffin Aerotech. Aerotech. Um, they have course made, of course, made Sky Cursor, mm-hmm. um, which is awesome, really incredible. Um, and that was like one of the first indie games we ever put out. Um, I think we only had Richardson when we put out Sky Cursor. Correct. I, yes, and it wasn't even like they, they didn't even have the score system com- complete. Right. By the time yeah. We put it out. Yeah. It was. Yeah. We and yeah. I think we put it out for our first anniversary, mm-hmm. um, like the day before, and so Arlington was coming, but it wasn't quite open yet. So, um, House of the Gun Dead is incredible, incredible game. We are having some issues keeping it on the floor. Um, it's using a lot of new tech. Um, and I think that that's probably why we're, we were, we were probably a great like alpha prototype test site mm-hmm. for them because like definitely a live fire at free point. Well, yeah, you're getting a lot of play and everything and you're probably finding out all of, all of the issues. And I will say that it seems like the majority of the issues um, have to do with the interplay between the operating system and the game files, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, the, if you've ever worked on these more modern arcade games, like you can see this really interesting interplay between running different versions of Windows, different versions of Linux, um, and like the choices that the arcade developers make, I don't even, I never understand. Um, but I can tell you that this one is having some issues with its operating system kind of becoming corrupt through the gameplay. So it's only available at Freeplay, I think in the entire world. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's working sometimes. So we have four of them. We we have well, we technically Somewhere. we have three on the floor. Three, yeah. um, <laughs> because because one of them was damaged in shipment by the the transport company. So that one's still kind of in progress. And I think the truth is they're probably waiting to actually finalize a version before we get the next one um, sent back to us because that is one of the things is they're 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 live live updating it live mm-hmm. on the fly, um, keeping it up. But I will say that when it's working, it's it's awesome. Yes, like, I, I've played is, it several times, and that is my favorite light gun game to play yeah. at this point and when you're playing it and it's working that thing is chef's kiss and i feel like i've never played the same game twice because i get different guns and they fire dramatically differently and that changes the gameplay entirely um even if the rooms you know cycle in a in a, in a even even the rooms are mixed up they're not ran procedurally generated but there are there is enough variety there that man i feel like i'm playing a new game every time i do play it so i, I love the game which really captures that into the Gungeon spirit, which mm-hmm. is kind of, you know, that's, it's a spin off of a PC game that's, I, I had never played until they announced this. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's, I see why so many people like, Enter the Gungeon is, is, you know, million plus purchase and all of that. Um, two million plus, I don't even know, but it has the most loyal fans. And I get it because if you play it once, you want to play it again. And the experience is almost completely unique every time, even if it's mm-hmm. the same dungeons or whatever you're going through. Um, really, really cool game. But yeah. Uh, Play it at free play. We're keeping them running as best as we can. Um, and if you have any like gameplay notes or anything, make sure you send them to us, and we'll make sure they get to the developer because um, we are like the alpha test site. Mm-hmm. We didn't really fully understand where we were on that, but we are now, and we're, we're pumped about it. <laughs> uh, uh, next on the kind of new games. This is something we've been tracking for years. It's been out for years, but not really so much stateside. I want, Arthur, I want you to talk. So we recently released a game at Dallas that was like half custom, half not custom which is the EX Arcadia. Um, what the hell is EX Arcadia? Like, I don't even know what this is. No, I'm just kidding. I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> EX Arcadia is the supposed most powerful arcade board that exists right now. I want to say they're out of Singapore, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. But it, the idea behind it was it was sort of, sort of works kind of like a Neo Geo in that you can have it, uh, four game cartridges in the back and uh, it doesn't have a whole lot of online functionality. Well, I, think it's, so. I guess it's properly pronounced EXA. Arcadia. I've always called it EX Arcadia, but sorry. Keep going. Ex Arcadia. Or I don't oh. know. Oh. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not General entirely Council? sure because I literally, <laughs> if you listen to the thing, it calls itself more than one name when it's going through its menus. Yeah. Oh, so, so you can just choose the one that fits you. Yeah. But uh, so we wanted to get it. They weren't ma- manufacturing cabinets in America at the time that we decided to try to get one. And I think they finally did. Decide so, to make so, some cabs. Really yeah, sure so I can that. provide a little bit of background on that. Um, <laughs> way back when, probably 2018, I don't know if that's the right, that sounds about the right date, they sent out um, a kind of flyer, and we received one of their flyers. And then Betson, uh, one of the major distributors of arcade games in the U.S., picked them up, and they had two cabinet styles um, that both looked pretty insane. Um, neither of those cabinets, I believe, ever got made. Um since the pandemic, they're making a much more traditional style cabinet, and I don't want to guess exactly where it's being made, but I'm pretty sure it's being made in Wisconsin at that place that it makes all of the arcade games right now that's not like a Rothrills. Um, so I, I, it looks really, really more generic now, their, their stock cabinets, and I, but I do believe they're popping up here and there. We did not go with the stock cabinet, though, did we? No. So Corey also had the interesting idea of the – uh, the Samsung Odyssey Arc monitor being used for something. That's a 55-inch curved screen monitor that is top of the line, OLED, and it's super fast and super cool. Yeah, so and- it, was, it kind of sold as like the greatest gaming monitor of all time when it came out, which is only a few, like maybe six months ago now or something like that. And it is, it's an incredible monitor. I kind of want one, but they're quite expensive, so I will not get one for myself. However, I had the most fun playing this game after we put it all together. So we took uh, the the shell from an Atomus Wave cabinet, and uh, I spent, I don't know exactly how long, a few weeks just uh, paring it down and putting in a bunch of supports and shelving inside to support the support the Exercadia board and the monitor itself because the monitor itself weighed like 100 pounds or something it was i don't know if it's that heavy, but it was pretty heavy and, and and of course one of the concerns you always have especially in those atomus wave cabinets is not making it too top heavy because the atomus wave cabinets were already a little on the top heavy side and 
anyway, so if you go to Fort Worth now, you can see the end result. But we, Dallas. Uh, Dallas, yes. I knew that. But we <laughs> took a, a couple of vertical scrolling shooters. Um, uh, Toho Perfect, Ser- uh, Perfect Cherry Blossom was uh, finally given an arcade release. I think that's the first Toho game that ever been given an arcade release. It's a bullet hell shooter. Very cool, actually. And Very cool. it's one of the hardest games I've ever played. <laughs> <laughs> and as well as another another shooter, uh, uh, Red and- Aka and Blue. And so you have this this curved screen that curves like up and around and almost behind you. And when you're looking at the, the object at the top of it, you have to crane your neck back and it's very engrossing. And it's one of the most interesting shooter experiences I've ever had. Yeah, I've said a lot of Ooh. negative things about VR and arcades. Um, and I, I'm sure one day I'll eat my words, but I haven't yet. But I will say that like I've played all of the VR games on the market. And the EX Arcadia at Free Play Dallas to me is the most ar- immersive arcade experience I've had. Um, I don't like I'm completely separated from the outside world. And what's really nice is I don't have to put someone else some goggles that someone else has been wearing all day and on. It's really cool. Yeah, only- you definitely you're surrounded by monitor when you play that game. Yeah. It's, it's quite the technical achievement, and uh, I'm I'm very proud of my friend Arthur who put it together. Uh, every time I I. I go by it, Dallas and see it being enjoyed and Thank played you. by the players there. Well, and what I will say is it's the most expensive stand-up There's we've no ever doubt. Yes. We, we, we've ever put out. <laughs> like, and and what's really great is designed and built completely in-house, yet the most expensive, which should tell you something about the products that are coming out of some of the other arcade manufacturers. Um, but yeah, so it was because it's top of the line arcade board, which is quite expensive. And you know, the prices are public with thousands of dollars. And then every game for it's thousands of dollars. And then of course I Popped on like a three or four thousand dollar monitor. Yeah, it really it got out of control. But it's very cool. And don't forget the Atomic Wave Cab that you purchased for price of one hundred and thirty five dollars. See, though, that was that was <laughs> that was the cost savings. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and it, all this can be yours for the low low price of twelve dollars, including tax. Eleven oh nine before tax. Yeah, so um, that you know the EXA or the EXA Arcadia or however you pronounce it is a really really cool system. Um, and I really really hope that it kind of like gets a little less niche than it is right now i like, want more games to be released on it right now like, well and more exclusives right yes. like because that's the big thing if you're putting a game out that's just so, something that everyone's playing on ps4 or ps5 or whatever it never feels quite as good now it's kind of funny that i say that right after nidhogg 2 but nidhogg 2 is a clear it's clear really arcade special. game it's an arcade game but like you can play it on your computer fine but you should be playing it on arcade word but uh, with, yeah. with a lot of the EX Arcadia games, EX, uh, I don't, see, I'm kind of saying, I don't even know. I, I just know that there's a big niche community for the uh, the Bullet Hell games. They've been they've been asking, and whenever we put them on the floor, they go and find it, even in every location. I, I hope all those those Bullet Hell loving players uh, go out to Free Play Dallas and, and really try this one out because it is it is all that, and it's. In in a genre that that gets pushed aside, you have the best cabinet possible. Even better than you dream possible to play it on. Yeah, I think I think it's really, really like a, a beautiful kind of ode to the genre too, because we did take a fifty-five inch, big curved gaming monitor, and so it it's like you know, everyone, every other, pretty much I think um, vertical shmup that's ever been put out, you know, at free play at least is all twenty-nine inches, like the biggest screen you're ever gonna put it on. And one of the big things here is when I decided to use a four K monitor, we had to find four K arcade hardware. And that there's only one that I'm aware of. I don't know if anyone. And that's the the EXA Arcadia or XA Arcadia. To the best of my knowledge, that's pretty much it. Because because you know like we get these brand new games in from like the major manufacturers, and they're all in 1080p or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So cool. Well, that is um, that was that. Let's talk maybe. Um, let's see. What's how much time? All right, we're gonna do a very quick, very quick thoughts on new pinball machines coming out because we don't have all that much time go out any other topics we'll get pushed to the next podcast all right so texas pinball festival is coming up um in about three weeks after recording this um we've been told there's two new games for sure um demoing is the is the third one demoing there do you know from multimorphic i do not know for sure but i would bet it is so that's it's I think one of the first times that three major pinball Multimorphic can, can load their stuff into an existing pinball machine. That's true. So that that one I'm almost certain, although I am not I'm just speaking. Alright, so we're gonna we're gonna go person by person and we're gonna get quick thoughts on these proposed pinballs and which one you're the most excited about coming out at Texas Pinball Festival. Because all of them I believe for the first time are gonna be publicly demoed at Texas Pinball Festival in about two or three weeks. 
Um, and we'll start with the probably the biggest one because it's a Stern game, and Stern is like, in terms of production numbers, no one's anywhere close to Stern, which is Foo Fighters. Quick thoughts, Kelsey. I love it. I love Foo Fighters. I uh, love Dave Grohl. Well, and you know what's really interesting is the the art package doesn't suck, um, which is new for Stern lately. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Chris, what do you think? I also enjoy Foo Fighters quite a bit, and I enjoy when I get to play Stern Pinball, so... I believe I will get to play Stern Pinball and and get to play this new uh, Foo Fighters thing uh, both here and when I travel. So I'm excited for it. That's true. It will be everywhere, won't it? Yes, it Um, will be everywhere. (laughs) Because that's kind of how every new Stern is um, right now. Because arcades are so thirsty for like just new pinball that that can be put on an arcade floor. A a Stern, Stern, I know what I'm going to get with a Stern. I rarely actively dislike it. I can think of a couple of the Sterns that I don't like, but for the most part, I either like them quite a bit or I really, really enjoy them. I've been playing Deadpool like on loop at yeah. Richardson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Arthur, what do you think? So when I think about Foo Fighters, the first thing that pops in my head is the video for Everlong where the guy would like grow his hand out and cosplay. slap people with his giant hand. Cosplay Arthur, please. <laughs> I haven't I haven't looked too much about the artwork of this game or anything, so, so but I'm hoping is... that that giant hand slap gets incorporated. I'm looking forward to finding out at Texas Pinball Fest. Yeah, well, it, it actually has their um, kind of space Foo Fighters um, theme, which is actually, I think, okay. going to be really work really well on pinball. The colors are are really really bright and and just incredible. It looks really good. And of course the like and and I've said this before, but we haven't been doing podcasts, so no one probably on the internet has heard me. I hated 007's design more than anything I've ever hated. <laughs> um, and we have two or three or four pros float, floating around, and I thought the pro was by far the best designed. Like just I'm talking just art package. Mm-hmm. Um, and that the collector's edition honestly was just like I don't know, like I don't know how it got got Which made. Of these is pro. This is pro. It's crazy. The thing that blows my mind about the James Bond machine is it says James Bond on it exactly nowhere. Like, right. I, well, I can't and, see the picture, but it doesn't say James Bond on and it. And it says Dr. No, though. Or Thunderball or <laughs> right. whatever. Yeah, depending so on I have the to do, do these pinball tournaments where I'm like, and now uh, on James Bond, I need player one, Arthur, and player two, Kelsey, and player three, Corey, and player four, it's me. And everybody's like, what? Dr. No. Please right. play on Dr. No. Well, and the interesting thing is, like, now there's so many different alternate translites that have been released aftermarket. And there's also, what's really funny is all the pinball sites sell just stickers that say James Bond 007 for you to slap somewhere <laughs> on, on, on the translite so that people will understand. Uh, yeah, I saw a, a pro that came up for sale because I guess they were trading out or or something and like they had basically just had james bond put on like 17 different spots so that everyone would know that was the james bond cabinet yeah how is eight-year-old radisson supposed to know (laughs) which one's james bond fair (laughs) point um so i think i I think the other thing is like the foo fighter songs are obviously going to work really really well with pinball i agree Um, yes I i think that that's you know it's it's been really kind of Rock obviously works great, and it's been kind of like the generic thing is like go with a rock band because that's gonna the the music will be, there's fans there's music will be good it'll play well but I think Foo Fighters is gonna be especially good um, and I I think it's I think I'm really excited be, that and I you know I I've, I'm like on record talking bad about Stern but I I am really excited Foo Fighters went with Stern instead of everyone else because I think Stern knows how to make that style of pin and I think they're gonna do a really good job. All right, so the next one we're gonna. We're gonna jump around a little bit. Multimorphic, who were, were so small until they announced Weird Al, because um, that was like their first big licensed pin. And Weird Al, uh, we're still waiting on ours. Uh, we ordered it a long time ago, um, but that was kind of they're famous for having this interchangeable pinball machine. Um, you can buy these dedicated cabinets that that say your game on the side, or you can buy these P3 cabinets um, where you can drop in stuff. It's really high tech stuff. Um, drop in new play fields and there's screens underneath the different play fields that, that can change everything like that. Um, so it's, it's really, really high tech. And I think it's designed not necessarily for operators like us. I think it's designed for people who might have space for one or two tables and that way they can, they can keep it fresh. I will say, I don't really know where they're putting their other play fields when they're not playing. Like that sounds like mm-hmm. a, a scary proposition laying a play field anywhere. Cause like yeah. safest place for a pinball play field is inside the game with the game turned off. Like that's that's where a playfield can be safe. But um, they did just announce Scott Denessi, um, who's kind of been jumping around all the different manufacturers. It feels like lately. Um, he's all got, but one. <laughs> he's got a new one coming out um, called Final Resistance with Multimorphic. 
Um, initial thoughts, Kelsey. I got it up on so, the screen. I mean, I we'll I put it up on the. Have has Multimorphic made anything that I might have played? Uh, only at the pin only at pinball fest. Freeblaze never had one. Um, um, Pinfest had I think the, I like their name by the way I think that's a good name what was it Lexi's Lightspeed um, I believe was, oh, was did you ever play one that seemed like you were playing a race car game oh god maybe yeah. I don't know isn't, you know, there, the isn't there one that's like a, that's similar to like uh, like you're breaking into a safe yes or... so that's my favorite of theirs and that, that one got pushed aside by the pandemic because it came out oh. like right in 2020 or maybe right after it um, it, 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 would, it involved like uh, a crane that moves your ball it called around. Heist. Yeah, it was called yes. Heist. I actually played that one at Texas Pinball Festival, and it's the one right before Weird Al, and it got totally shafted it by the release. It looks kind of cool. It was fun. I really enjoyed that game. But yeah, so um, they announced Weird Al, and orders skyrocketed. Yes, sure. Everyone um, loves Weird because, Al because because this it's also it's not a cheap um, platform, and, and it was really interesting because Weird Al went with Multimorphic. I mean, I assume Multimorphic probably like went after him, and we're, we're able to close the deal because you would yeah. think. I mean, Weird Al is is a little niche, but like our generation, obviously, is huge. Is now like at the level to maybe buy our own pinball, and I feel like that that's yeah, that's kind of like where most pinball, like Foo Fighters and Weird Al, like right. it's not they're not, they're a, like, not a giant gigantic um, demo difference. Yeah, and they're just well loved kind of concepts and people. So, um, anyways, let's let's so go. Scott okay, so Scott to Nessie, 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 final oh, sorry, final resistance, this. final resistance. So what's the what, what is Final Resistance? What exactly does that theme? I mean, like, are you? So, is it the end so, of time and I human mean, beings are finally resisting? Yeah, I think it's um, you know, synthwave dystopia. You're, there's the final resistance against some sort of behemoth. And I don't know if that's I don't true. Know. I'm not but... like that hasn't grabbed me. The theme has not grabbed me, but I don't know. Maybe the play mechanics are just like gonna knock my socks off. I don't know. What? I don't... And and of course, Danessi is um famous for soundtracks for for pinball like total nuclear annihilation for example was. that is amazing i mean triple a fantastic on that well yeah i mean we we've had boom boxes and, mm-hmm. and tapes of total nuclear annihilation because it was so cool such a cool soundtrack i mean i love good music but you do need the pinball to i think play. i want to pair scott with a screenwriter yeah yeah, yeah. there you go yeah. right he well, can score it right he can be the john williams to and, somebody else and the art and the art yeah yeah i just I, I think but yeah i think that's the thing my favorite thing about great pinballs are you know kind of getting into the game story like Mm -hmm. like that's that's normally the difference for me between like good pinball and a great pinball. i mean they could i mean do the same kind of theme except make it like the fifth element and like actually pull in a real theme oh that would be interesting like like get danessi a a a big license like fifth element that would be interesting yeah Mm -hmm. that's a good idea take note arthur what are your thoughts on final resistance by multimorphic so i haven't paid too much attention to it uh looking at it it has a Kind of a simple looking play field. It kind of reminds me of Total Nuclear Annihilation. Uh, looks cool. I'm happy to play it once it comes out. Danessi did do Rick and Morty pinball, which was kind of interesting because it was maybe the most hyped, one of the most hyped pinballs I've ever seen come out, and it it faded so fast. Maybe it was the the pandemic. I don't even know. I I, they shipped them all. I didn't play they, they ship them? I have never played. We it. we had a um, pre order, um, and during the pandemic, I actually sold our spot in line ah. because. Uh, you know, we, yeah. we were broke. Right? Fair <laughs> so, and, and people were still, it hadn't really come out yet. So people were really, really, really. I enjoyed Heist. You know, I want to give it a try. I guess I will give it a try at the Texas Pinball Festival. Man, I sure would like them to put the games out there in a way in which you can play them. Yeah. So. Well, that's 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 one of the things that I think is really interesting. I'll, I'll give it to free play because we'll, sh- we'll be putting it in front of so many, 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 many more people so well, that they will sell more multimorphic pinball machines. That is every time I've ever spoken to... Um, any of the heads or anyone with any authority at Jersey Jack or Spooky or anywhere that I can get. I talk about the the ability of Stern to make a quality pro-level pinball, right? That's the bottom level, but it's clearly a, like pro-level to me is almost, that's the commercial pinball. Mm. Like anything that's a limited edition doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I know there's lots of speculators that built whole arcades trying to flip limited editions and stuff like that. And I always hated that. Um, but Stern will build these really solid pro level tables um, that are great. They're wonderful to play. They're relatively stable. They're relatively easy to keep up um, for pinball. Like they're still terrible to keep up in like a free play style arcade. But mm-hmm. I they get so much marketing because of what they are. Um, because you know, like I can name like even places that aren't nearly as cool as free play. 
um, that have a slew of stern tables and nothing else right. because that's the only thing that they can really use. And so for a lot of people, there's not even another pinball manufacturer. Like they they are not encountering any other pinball manufacturer besides stern. Um, we have Jersey Jack. We still have Spooky on the floor, but those are they're challenging tables to keep on the floor versus the, some of these sterns. Um, so what I've been telling, you know, when I, when I talk to Jersey Jack, I'm like, give us the clear commercial model, like whatever it's going to be, give us that commercial model so that we can get them to the people and let people know that you exist. Um, because that is marketing. That is like, you know, like a lot of brewers, for example, want their beers in certain bars so that people see them and then go buy them at the grocery store or wherever they're trying to, or even just go to the brewery. Like there's an, there's a marketing aspect here. And I, that's that's my big concern is you know multimorphic. I don't know if they're how many commercial arcades they are. Certainly, I don't know of very many free play style arcades that they exist at. Um, we're gonna test them. We're gonna try um, if if and when our our um, weird owl ever comes in. Um, so, but that's it. We gotta keep moving. Let's talk about the third game um, that's going to be a Texas Pinball Festival for the first time ever. Jersey Jack game, The Godfather. Uh, Kelsey, first thoughts. It's the 50th anniversary of The Godfather, so it's the 50-year anniversary Godfather table. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I love the God. I love the movie The Godfather, but like, I, I'm still thinking about the Fifth Element. That's a better. You know, you unlock each of your elements. You know, okay, it makes sense to me. But like, the what do you unlock at The Godfather? Like I'm gonna, Sunny not dying. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the first time we have the aforementioned eight-year-old Radisson play it, and she beats the mission to get the horse head. Right. Oh, this is going to be great. Yeah, maybe the mission is to de- deliver the horse head. Like, yes. oh, I'm trying to think about this. Here's what I will say: um, is the collector's edition cabinet, in my opinion, is both like so terrible looking that it's good, like, or that so terrible it's good, like it is oh. over the top. And I think, like, I, I don't actually want to put it anywhere, but, like, I want to go somewhere and see this, like, hideous monstrosity and just appreciate it. What are your thoughts? You don't like it? I Did you don't. see the little leg the decoration? I mean. Whoa. I don't know, though. Like, the <laughs> Godfather was, like, it's too flashy. Like. Well, yeah, I, I agree. And, and, like, the topper to me. not Godfather-like. So, they, allegedly, you can interact with the topper, which, I mean, there are toppers that have done this before. It's not, like, the first ever. But, allegedly, you can interact with the topper in the game. Um, but I always, it's kind of weird because it's kind of, like, generic mobster topper rather than necessarily, like, Godfather topper. I don't know. Are you talking like you interact with the NBA fast break? Talk no, I machine. assume not. I assume it's just going to like move based on something you hit. I will say it's kind of funny on the on the collector's edition. Your your launcher mm-hmm. is the horse head. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy, Radisson. Enjoy. You literally pull. Um, oh wow! And they're they're trying to get a patent on the the a horse head. No, um, no, no. I'm sorry. On the leg on because the leg sculptures. Be. They're trying to get a patent to I guess prevent anyone else from having decorated legs i don't know oh, but hasn't wow. that happened before yeah alive. well these are hiding the bolts i've never seen one that hides the bolts maybe that's what they're trying to get they're so bright looking now. yeah yeah it is incongruous and and i don't actually know they so they've announced the collector's edition and a limited edition i haven't seen the their standard edition or whatever they call the the models that are still twelve thousand dollars we will be able to see this at the texas texas pinball, pinball festival. festival yeah okay well, um, there we go we've of course had oh. just about every jersey jack on the floor, um, although you might have noticed that Jersey Jack hasn't been, none of their new stuff has been on the floor um, for a while. And that was, uh, if you're a longtime listener to the podcast, you know that we bought two Pirates of the Caribbean, um, <laughs> brand new, right at launch before pretty much anyone else had Pirates. And we were going to use them as like kind of a demo slash fun um, game at one of our big pinball tournaments where, I don't know, $5,000 prizes, stuff like yep. that. And they arrived, and they were brand new, so we could, we were like, we can count on these to be reliable. Neither one of them worked when it was delivered. <laughs> Out of the box broken. Um, and one of them was wired backwards um, at nu- in numerous places. Uh, the other one had, had just catastrophic problems. I fixed the one with catastrophic problems. Um, like, I don't even remember how I – I was like, I started down the rabbit hole, and I was like, I'm going to fix this pin. And, like, it took me, like, 12 straight hours of work, and then I fixed it. Um both of them are out, but you know it didn't. You know we just spent I don't even remember twenty five or thirty thousand dollars on these two pins. And I just just like man, that's not a fun experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we were able to get one up for the tournament by the ones that were just wired backwards, um, and then the other one I, I was later able to get up. But we have not released Willy Wonka or 
Guns N' Roses or Toy Story 4. Um, pretty much because we've had so many so many issues. We do still have Jersey Jack out, and I I, I love Dialed In. I actually mm-hmm. thought of Hobbit and, and Wizard of Oz were solid pins. Like, I have played Guns N' Roses, and I can tell you, if you had it... I would never run it in a tournament. Yeah, ever. Gun, Guns and Roses. Never. Guns and Roses um, kind of came out and was kind of a, considered a stinker. Um, I mean, I, 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 as someone who enjoys playing, enjoys the music, right? It'll, it'll, sure. it'll send you an entire multi ball that lasts the entire song, right? So you get to hear the whole song. So if you want to jam out to Guns and Roses for two hours in one pinball game, that's going to happen. Um, but also, that's I can't have one pinball game go on for over an hour in a tournament. So. It would be out. It's like Lord of the Rings. I, I remember <laughs> even more so. Yes. I, yeah, I remember. Well, I remember the very first time I met someone that owned a Lord of the Rings pinball. They took me in there like, you want to see my pin? I was like, yes. I, lo- I was like, Lord of the Rings is supposed to be like one of the greatest games ever. Two you wizard know? modes later. And and then, yeah, he played it for like an hour straight. Yeah. And then he just he was like, isn't this great? I'm like, no, I'm so bored of watching you play yeah. pinball. Please, please stop. And it was just <laughs> over and over and over. It was, uh, I mean, it was, it was incredible. It was a great game. But yeah, when we had that Lord of the Rings out on our floors, it, they were just people would play 30 straight minute games and you would just be like, people would be in line. Just like, am I ever going to get to play it? And the answer is no. It's, yeah, no. This game is never ending. Mm-hmm. Um, that's it. I still love Dialed In. Like the movies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do still love Dialed In. I love, I love my experience playing Jersey Jacks that right. function. Well, well but... and, and maybe maybe the truth is they're just home games. Maybe that, that's it. We can't have them at the arcade. But I need people to make, I want, uh, I want competition for Stern to keep it moving forward because we know right. the competition is what makes things good. Like yeah. that, it has to it has to be there. That's what drives it. And Jersey Jack is clearly committed to innovation, all sorts of crazy stuff. It just mm-hmm. has to actually work. All right, all right. Um, so all three of those playable at Does American um, have anything that they're pushing there? I don't I think it's just still Hot Wheels. Hot Wheels. They had Hot Wheels and they had, I think, I believe Valhalla last, uh, last year. That does sound right. Um Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I would I would like to see another contemporary for Stern to to so they they so they did playing with. they did do that Oktoberfest. Um, uh, that was that was like their first one. It's been yeah, around for quite yeah. some time. And then Valhalla and Hot Wheels. I mean, Hot, Hot Wheels um, is maybe the most requested pinball that we've never put out. It's it uh, is a great um, collector game. I, I yeah I I like the pin in yeah. general, and yeah. I actually think that they it was the right idea. I just I don't know I don't I don't know if it's very likely we're ever gonna have it on free play. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's more likely we'll have like a Hot Wheels course that you get to push a car on there. I think Ooh. that'd be more reliable and fun. Sorry, <laughs> not trying to throw so much shade. I actually yeah. like Hot Wheels pinball plenty. Can we put like a Hot Wheels track that just circles around <laughs> right. one of the, your crazy rooms and oh, it's the launch? No, um, I, I I will say that I think Hot Wheels is the most. It, it really is the most requested game that we we don't have out on the floor. But I think it's because people just kind of know that we're pushing off of Jersey Jack and Spooky, not because we we love them, but we can't keep them on the floor. Um, so I think they were like, why not Hot Wheels? Mm-hmm. And there's there's reasons, but. Texas Pinball Festival is coming. Um, we, I can, I'll just go ahead and spoil this because I don't know when this podcast will come out. Um, we will have two of the Foo Fighters that are on the floor will be free play Foo Fighters. Um, that's that's our new philosophy. I buy two of every Stern Pro, and then I go from there because we have five locations now, and uh, I think we can always use two of every Stern Pro. Whether or not we're going to get a premium, we'll never put a limited edition out. I still think that that's lame. Um, but whether or not we get a premium version will depend on how good the premium version is how different it is from the pro and if it really just a, and if the art package is good because james bond has ruined me forever no monsters premium actually ruined me forever on premiums but james bond was was not doing me any favors either so that about wraps it up uh we had more topics which means we have to make more podcasts so if you like this content you should hit subscribe wherever the bell it. icon yeah <laughs> smash the bell or whatever you do um we are um we're getting back into it and we're really excited. So please make sure you do subscribe because we do have content. And if you don't get your podcasts on YouTube or anywhere else, those updates are coming too. So uh, stay subscribed, stay active, and we will keep making new content. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody.